In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So today, the Church puts before our eyes the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, the two mighty pillars of the Church. St. Peter, the Apostle to the Jewish nation, and St. Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles. There are so many images of these two together in sacred art, very often with Peter and Paul embracing one another in fraternal charity. But they were both certainly very different people with different temperaments. They both ministered to two mutually opposed groups of people like the Jews and the Gentiles i.e. the rest of the world. And today's feast also reminds us that we cannot live our Christian life alone. Peter was one arm of the body of Christ and Paul the other, both of which the Lord used to build a foundation which stands rock solid to this very day. They were like the sun and the moon, uh, providing the light for the church day by day, I suppose, night by night, for almost two millennia. Enough cannot be said concerning the two greatest apostles that the church and the world has ever known. And yet, both had been exceedingly humbled by circumstances in their lives and thereby also became two great examples of repentance. St. Peter denied the Lord, not once, but three times. The Church has always considered apostasy and denial of our Saviour to be an offence of incalculable magnitude. However, Peter, by his sincere repentance, was reinstated after the Lord's resurrection and was strengthened with the Holy Ghost. And the once fearful disciple became a light to the world and even died for his faith around the year 67 AD. And we recall that St Paul persecuted and even killed Christians before he received his call from on high, when he saw the Lord in a blinding light that darkened his eyes, but enlightened his soul. And both of these teachers and luminaries had two essential wings by which they flew to heaven. The first, the life-giving repentance for their past sins, and the second, the real contact they had with the Saviour and Lord, which gave them a life-giving faith in his true divinity. Talk about real contact. That's a funny thing to talk about in today's COVID days, isn't it? But there are lots of uh, examples in sacred scripture of these contacts, these encounters with the Lord. We're all familiar with the encounter with Christ on the road to Emmaus. In fact, we're reminded of it every Easter Monday uh, in the Gospel of the Day. And I mentioned just now the famous encounter of our Lord with St. Paul on the road to Damascus. And there is a very famous encounter some people say it's legendary, but it's so rooted in uh, Christian history that it's certainly true in some way, between our Lord and St. Peter on his way out of Rome to escape the persecution. And the three examples all happened at different times and in different places, but they are all illustrations of the same thing. The disciples on the way to Emmaus, uh, St. Peter and St. Paul, are all on the road 
away from the path that our Lord wants them to take. The disciples have given up on the gospel and don't believe in the resurrection, even though they've spoken to eyewitnesses of the risen Lord. The very day they leave and go off to Emmaus, they spoke to people who had seen our Lord risen from the dead. Um, St. Paul, of course, is on his way to persecute the growing number of Christians in Damascus. And St. Peter, this is very similar to the Gospel story, isn't it, today, where he's arrested by Herod and then thrown into prison. And, of course, as the persecution became more fierce in, the, in Rome, where he was later, then the disciples tried to persuade him to leave the city of Rome because it was too dangerous. He could get caught and put to death by the Roman authorities. So he is, in fact, just leaving the city. And then they all meet the one whom St. Peter in the Gospel today calls the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, in former times, uh, we might have been persuaded to sing full in the panting heart of Rome or some other ultramontane extravagance. You can see why. I mean, it's a, a historically Protestant country, and so um, what marked Catholics, apart from their heretical neighbours, is the veneration for the successor of St. Peter. That's understandable. But it's a curious thing, the final hymn, which we are actually singing today, we don't sing... The church's one foundation is St. Peter and St. Paul. <laughs> we don't. We sing Jesus Christ our Lord. Because he is the foundation of the church. I mean, there are historical reasons why the Church of Rome has made this feast a holy day of obligation, and it is true. The visible head of the Catholic Church is still the successor of Peter. And much of the New Testament is comprised of the letters of St. Paul. But it is what they teach that is significant. That hasn't changed in 2,000 years and cannot change. Sometimes in the history of the church, Peter, or one of his successors, has to be reminded of this. There's that very famous example in uh, Galatians, I think it is, where, to use St. Paul's words, Paul at one time withstood, which is opposed, Peter to his face, for he was to be blamed. In our own day, of course, there's the stellar example of Archbishop Lefebvre, who withstood Peter, ironically, in the person of Pope Paul, and indeed the whole of the organised hierarchy, for they were to be blamed. So in spite of this apparent tension, we can see today within this feast an example of how we are to live with each other in the church. I was talking about Peter and Paul being very different people and certainly as people from all walks of life um, different backgrounds often different cultures even nowadays in these latter days different languages but today's feast shows us that the church is first and foremost a place where God's love reigns as the Lord says, the world will know us by the love we have for one another. It is this love from one God that enables us to overcome our, uh, what can we call them, our interpersonal difficulties. Let's call them that, interpersonal difficulties. And it is this love which reminds us that with God, all things are possible. And hence, when Christ commands us to love our enemies, 
it is with the full knowledge that it is his love and grace that will give us the strength to do so. God doesn't ask us to like our neighbours or enemies. He commands us to love our neighbours and our enemies, a task which is far greater and is not predicated on how we feel. But it is a choice. It is a conscious decision on our part to will the highest good for everyone we come in contact with. Love is therefore a choice. It is how we choose to act or respond. And the great saints Peter and Paul exemplify it to us that even if we are different and even if we have disagreements, we can still live and work together in the church and we can find reconciliation one to another through God's grace and love. That is, if we are willing. Often the only thing that stands in the way of being truly reconciled one to another is a conscious choice to be humble and to say with heartfelt meaning to those who offend us the two words that literally burns the devil when we say them, forgive me. Would be nice if whenever we decide from fear, ignorance or even malice to depart from the path that our Lord has chosen for us, if we could have an Emmaus moment or a Damascus moment, even a Quo Vardis encounter. But we have. We have that today, here in Edinburgh, here in this church. And it's not unexpected. It doesn't occur with a blinding light and a voice from heaven, but it occurs nonetheless in Holy Communion. In that silent encounter, Christ is as truly and really present as he was on the road to Emmaus. I don't know what he says to each individual because he doesn't reveal that to me. And he, <laughs> even sometimes at my own communion, I'm worried about Siboria or uh, what they're going to sing next. or <laughs> I might miss what he has to say to me. But he's there, nonetheless, and you meet him in Holy Communion every time you kneel down at that altar rail. So in today's Mass, we might ask the Holy Apostles to intercede to him on our behalf that our souls may find grace and mercy here and in the world to come. And let us strive to imitate the repentance and the life-giving faith of these two apostles, which will enable us to conquer the world, as did they. It is always possible through God's grace to walk hand in hand, even if we don't always see eye to eye, so that, united by the love of God, we'll be able to proclaim with one voice the life to the life-giving Trinity, the Father, oh, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, glory forevermore. Amen.